Welcome to this IAS USA webinar. Today is Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. My name is Jose Francisco and I'm a project manager at IAS USA. We are excited to cover today's presentation on optimizing antiviral outcomes through clinical pharmacology. We are delighted to welcome today's moderator, Dr. Charles W. Flexner, Professor of Medicine, Pharmacology and Molecular Sciences and International Health at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. We'll be going over our introduction slides and moderate our Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Welcome, Dr. Flexner. Thank you, Jose, and welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on optimizing antiviral outcomes through clinical pharmacology. Um, it is my pleasure to be moderating this webinar uh, and be with you for the next hour and 15 minutes. Um, before we, we begin, we have some important business announcements. First of all, here are the financial disclosures for all of those in the uh, IAS USA uh, uh, web board. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here are financial disclosures for today's speaker and uh, for myself as the moderator. Next slide. Um, the, today's uh, session is uh, available for continuing medical education credits. Um, the IAS USA designates this activity for a maximum of 1.25 AMA PRA category one credits and physicians should claim only the credit commensurate with the extent of their participation in the activity. Um, and this is just uh, a list of the CME credits available for uh, this webinar. It includes CME credit for nursing contact hours uh, and for pharmacy contact hours. And here are the, uh, 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 here's the uh, 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 um, information on the grant support for today's session. Um, these are the companies that have generous, generously provided support uh, for our webinar today. Next. Um, the recording and slides from this webinar will be available uh, within 24 hours after the end of today's live broadcast on the IAS USA website. Uh, and there is also information on that website about claiming your uh, CME credits. Next. So we will have live poll questions during this webinar. Um, a separate window will show the poll questions in your Zoom feed. Choose your response for the poll question. Um, and then responses will be, be displayed after the poll closes, uh, usually in uh, 30 to 40 seconds. We encourage you to submit questions for the speaker for our panel discussion at the end of today's webinar, but do that using the Q&A button, not the chat button. Um, we apologize in advance if we are not able to address all questions in the time allotted. Uh, but um, you may use the chat to start a discussion with other attendees, but do not use the chat to submit your questions or comments for the speaker. Please do that using the Q&A function, which we will be mon monitoring. Next. So I would now like to turn this over to today's speaker, Jennifer Kaiser from uh, the University of Colorado. School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences uh, in the School of Medicine. Uh, Jennifer is uh, uh, an associate professor and is co-director of the Antiviral Pharmacology Lab at the University of Colorado, Denver, and is uh, well known internationally as uh, really one of the leading lights in uh, uh, cutting edge research in the use of clinical pharmacology to better understand the rational use of, anti of antiviral drugs. And so, I, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you. We very much look forward to your talk today. Thank you very much, Dr. Flexner. Just share my slides here. Okay, hopefully everyone can see those okay. Um, let's start with a polling question. So I see a lot of familiar names here, but I'm curious, what's your clinical academic training or background? Um, I think we went straight to the answer rather than the poll. Oops. We need to go back and 
uh, have the poll have the question pop up first. Apologies for the uh, short technical difficulty. One second here. There we go. Thank you, Jose. Okay, looks like I have about 24% physicians, uh, some nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, PA, a public health professional, and then 53% pharmacists. So um, great, a good group for this discussion. Okay, so when I complete this webinar, I would hope you are able to define some key clinical pharmacology concepts for antiviral drugs to be able to compare and contrast the clinical pharmacology and concentration effect associations for contemporary antiviral drugs, and to describe some modern analytical approaches to defining PKPD relationships. I have uh, two pretest questions for you. The first one will be about cabotegravir here. Which of the following statements regarding the pharmacokinetic and pharmacokinetic dynamics of long-acting cabotegravir is correct? Number one, the CAB absorption rate, or KA, is faster than the elimination rate, KE. Variability in CAB absorption rate is low. Sex, BMI, and smoking influence cabotegravir PK. Or four, CAB concentrations are not associated with viral failure or time to viral failure in persons with HIV. Which of those is correct? Okay, good. There's um, a split here in the answers. About a third think um, the CAB absorption rate is faster than the elimination rate. About a third think the variability in CAB absorption rate, KA, is low. And about a third think sex, BMI, and smoking influence CAB PK. And then I guess a handful that thought that CAB concentrations were not associated with viral failure or time to viral failure in persons with HIV. I'm not going to tell you the answer yet. All right, the next question, which of the following statements regarding the PK and PD of nermotrelvir ritonavir is correct? Nermotrelvir is highly protein bound. The protein adjusted 90% effective concentration for nermotrelvir is 292. Race, weight, and renal function influence the PK. Or in the EPIC-SR and EPIC-HR trials in persons with COVID, those with a nermotrelvir trough above 1,000 had faster time to symptom resolution. Okay, um, let's see, 20% thought it was highly protein bound, 10% thought the protein adjusted 90% effective concentration was 292. Race, weight, and renal function influenced the PK. That one had the highest um, number of voters. And then lastly, um, PKPD associations from EPIC SR and EPIC HR revealed that a trough above 1,000 had a faster time to symptom resolution. Okay, again, I'm not gonna tell you the answer right now, but hopefully you'll get it throughout the presentation. All right, so we're gonna talk about some key PKPD concepts. And some of this might be a review um, for the pharmacists in the group, but I think it's good to make sure we're all on the same page. So just as an introduction to this topic, this graph shows the relationship between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And the PK piece of this is the relationship between dose and concentrations in the body. It encompasses the processes of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And PK can be thought of as um, how the body handles the drug. The pharmacodynamic piece is the relationship between drug concentrations and therapeutic or toxic effects. 
and it can be thought of as how the drug affects the body. Now for every drug, we need to define the concentrations uh, needed to maximize the desired effect and minimize the toxicities. And they call this range of concentrations the therapeutic index. So this is a graphical representation of the concept of a therapeutic index. We want our concentrations to be above the amount needed to either prevent acquiring the virus if it's used for prevention or to inhibit viral replication if it's used for treatment but we don't want it to be so high that it causes um, toxicities. So this range of concentrations between toxicity and efficacy um, is, is quite wide for current antivirals compared to those we used you know, 20 years ago. Um, but even with contemporary antivirals, there, with wide therapeutic indices, there remains a lot of variability in exposures, um, which may shift an individual outside of the desired range. And this is an illustration of this variability, albeit it's with an anti-epileptic rather than an antiviral. Um, but this graph shows that even after normalizing the phenytoin dose by weight, that there's still considerable um, interpatient variability with the same dose. And variability tends to be greater with drugs given via non-intravenous routes. And there are several intrinsic and extrinsic factors that may contribute to this PK variability. I'll give you a minute just to think about a few of those. Okay, hopefully a few of these came to mind for you. Some intrinsic factors that may contribute to PK variability include genetic variation, particularly in the gene in the um, enzymes or the transporters um, that are responsible for metabolizing or moving substances um, uh, from, from one compartment to another, age, weight or BMI, gender and organ impairment. Um, extrinsic factors include adherence, diet, uh, smoking, and then drug, herbal, or supplement interactions. So we're going to talk about absorption, transport, metabolism, and excretion now, and keep these intrinsic and extrinsic factors in mind as we do. Um, think about how they might impact these specific processes. So let's start with concepts around how drug gets delivered to the systemic circulation. So absorption is the passage of drug from the site of administration to the site of measurement, usually the blood. And often we think of absorption from the GI tract, but it refers to passage from any extravascular route, like intramuscular or subcutaneous. Um, and there are two ways the drug gets from the site of administration to the site of measurement. Either it occurs via a zero order process that delivers drug at a constant rate, similar to an IV infusion, so think implants for that, or more commonly where the concentration gradient drives the input, which is a first order process. And the two drugs that we're gonna talk about today, cabotegravir and nermotrelivir have um, first order kinetics. Another important concept is bioavailability. So this is the fraction of the dose that reaches the systemic circulation. And it's expressed as either um, uh, between zero and one or a percentage. And you have absolute bioavailability when an extravascular exposure is compared with IV exposure and then relative bioavailability where you may be comparing two different extravascular formulations like IM to oral cabotegravir. Okay, in distribution, this is the process of reversible transfer of a drug to and from the site of measurement in the peripheral tissues. And the volume of distribution is an individual's drug's propensity to remain in plasma or distribute to other compartments. So high drugs with a high volume of distribution distribute widely and those with a low VD remain mostly in plasma. And the units are expressed in liters. So as for um, metabolism, this is a conversion of one chemical species to another. And this graph shows the relative contribution of phase one and two enzymes to metabolism. Phase one enzymes uh, shown on the left oxidize, reduce, or hydrolyze compounds, and phase two enzymes shown on the right include glucuronidation and sulfation. These enzymes can be inhibited, uh, blocked, or induced, or upregulated, and some of them are polymorphic. Polymorphic meaning that some individuals may express a lot of a particular enzyme and therefore have lower levels of substrates, or they may express little of that enzyme and have high levels of the substrate. So here are some of the enzymes that are polymorphic, CYP2D6, CYP2C9, CYP2C19. And then this is an example of metoprolol exposures in poor metabolizers shown in black and extensive metabolizers shown in red 
And elimination, finally, is the irreversible loss of drug from the site of measurement. Um, the elimination rate is the rate at which drug is removed, and it's based on the terminal elimination phase, and units are inverse time. Half-life is calculated from KE, and half-life is the time it takes for concentrations to decline by half. Drugs take about five half-lives to reach steady state and to wash out. So we'll talk about transporters now because these can in, uh, influence A, D, M, and E. And there are thousands of membrane transporters and they play a really important role in the PK of drugs and in the PD of drugs in some cases. And they're influx transporters responsible for pumping drugs um, in, or substances into a cell or tissue. And then there are efflux transporters which are responsible for pumping substances out of the cells. So some important transporters relevant for antivirals that you'll hear about include PGP and BCRP, which are um, located in many different cell and tissue types. These are efflux transporters that pump substances out of those cells, and they also may limit, in, for instance, in the GI tract, they may limit absorption. Um, some other important transporters, OP1B1. This is a hepatic uptake transporter, and so many protease inhibitors are substrates for OP1B1, or they may be inhibitors of OP1B1. So substances that utilize OP1B1 to get into the liver may be inhibited and therefore have higher blood concentrations. Um, the OAT transporters in the kidney um, and the OCT2 transporters in the kidney are important for taking substances up into those cells. And then MATE1 is um, an efflux transporter. MATE1 and OCT2 are creatinine um, transporters. And so you will have, um, in some cases, when drugs inhibit MATE1, an increase in serum creatinine, which may be confused for renal toxicity, but in fact is just a, um, a, a, a result of having these two transporters, one of these two transporters inhibited. And these transporters can be inhibited and induced just like enzymes. Okay, now we're gonna talk about protein binding. Um, I'm gonna focus here on um, protein binding alterations with antiviral drugs, and it's particularly those that are highly protein bound. So protein binding impacts distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And so we typically measure total concentrations of a drug. So that's bound plus unbound. And that's because the ratio of unbound to total drug, or what we call the fraction unbound, usually does not change. So measuring unbound concentrations, which is analytically challenging and costly, is unnecessary. But in certain conditions where binding is altered or saturated, such as hepatic impairment or pregnancy, the fraction unbound can change, and thus measuring unbound drug becomes important for interpreting the results and determining whether any dose adjustment is needed. Unbound drug is what typically passes through cell membranes uh, to reach sites of drug storage, metabolism, or activity. Thus, this form largely dictates the therapeutic and toxic effects. So I'm going to give you two scenarios here on why unbound concentrations are useful. Okay, so the first is if only protein binding is altered. Then total drug levels, which are a combination of bound and unbound drug, will be lower because the drug gets displaced from its binding sites and any excess free drug is just gonna be cleared. But the actual concentration of unbound drug, that's shown in green there, um, that's the pharmaco pharmacologically active part and that part's unchanged. <laughs> but Total levels can also appear normal or low when there is both a change in protein binding and a slowed clearance. So for example, with cabotegravir, the total AUC is 27% lower, as shown in the figure, in patients with child QB cirrhosis, but the actual unbound concentration, which is shown in purple here at two and 24 hours post-dose, is actually higher in those with uh, cirrhosis versus those without hepatic impairment. So a dose adjustment isn't needed here because CAB has a wide therapeutic index and this increase isn't thought to, be, um, to have any clinical implications. But if this phenomenon occurs with a drug that, just, that has a, a tight therapeutic index or a narrow therapeutic index, then a dose adjustment may be necessary. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna talk about specific PK parameters. So when we conduct an intensive PK study where we give an observed dose of drug and then obtain samples at specific time points, um, here are some of the observed parameters. So you have the maximum concentration, you have a C-trough, or sometimes it's called a C-tau if it's the last concentration in the dosing interval. 
You have the C min or the minimum concentration, which may occur at the trough or may not. Um, the T max, which is the time that the C max occurs. And then a T lag. This is the time of the last sample prior to the first sample with a measurable concentration. And this only happens with extravascular um, administration of a drug. And then we have calculated AUC parameters. So AUC um, is uh, calculate parameters. AUC is the first one. This is a total exposure to drug over time. And to calculate an AUC, you will calculate the area between each of the concentrations and add them up. And the units are expressed. This is an example as nanogram hour per ml. The AUC last, um, this part is calculated. And this is to the last measurable concentration. If you're doing AUC to infinity, you can't sample to infinity, so you have to estimate some portion of it. We like to keep the portion that we estimate low. And then an AUC tau, it could be the same as the AUC last if the concentration was obtained, you know, exactly at the time of, um, uh, exactly at the time of the dosing interval ending, um, or it may be estimated. And then we calculate clearance from AUC, it's dose over AUC, and it's how quickly the body removes the drug from the bloodstream. And it's ex expressed as mils per minute or liters per hour as examples. And clearance reflects the combination of metabolism, transport, and excretion. So concentration time data may fit either a one compartment or a two or a more compartment uh, model. So on the top, you have the one compartment model. And this model ignores the distribution phase. The assumption is that neglig negligible drug is removed during the distribution. Um, above and beyond what would have been removed had distribution been instantaneous. So we often see um, on the PK profile is a straight line. That's how we know there's um, a one compartment drug. <clears throat> and if the concentrations do not fall on a straight line and you have what looks like almost two lines, then there's another distribution compartment for the drug. And we would calculate the KE and the half-life from the terminal phase of this. In a two compartment model, you will have other rates estimated in and out um, of this uh, a secondary compartment. So K12, K21 here, and you may have two estimates for clearance and two estimates for volume versus only one clearance and one volume estimate with a one compartment model. So population PK, this is the study of pharmacokinetics at the population level. And with this, we're trying to identify um, the PK parameters in a population and sources of variability in those PK parameters. So these are some examples of, you know, six different patients with concentrations obtained for each of them. And then we put all this data together for our population model. The components of a population model include the concentration and time data. There's also a structural model that describes the data, a statistical model to account for unexplainable or random variability. And then there's a covariate model, which is all the, um, the factors that we think may influence the PK. <clears throat> so in, in terms of interpreting a population uh, PK model, so I'm just gonna show you an example here with cabotegravir. So with this model, you have um, PK data from both an oral dose as well as the long acting. You have absorption rates for both of those uh, routes of administration. You have a central compartment and a clearance associated with that. And then you have our peripheral compartment. And this Q is the intercompartmental clearance. And so when you get this table, um, there's a lot of information here, but what you'll see is that the KA estimates um, for both the oral and the um, IM routes are shown, the clearance estimate from the central compartment, the volume for the central compartment, the estimate of the intercompartmental clearance here, the estimate for the volume in the peripheral compartment. This F1 is the relative bioavailability comparing the two formulations. You have some estimates for the error, and then you have the influence of the different covariates. And we're gonna talk a bit more about these specific covariates in just a moment. But so now you don't have to be afraid of, of these big tables and how to interpret the, the POP-PK models. You may also wish to use physiologic-based PK modeling. So this differs from traditional PK modeling because it includes drug properties and physiologic and biochemical data. And using this type of model, you can determine um, the, the PK in specific compartments, for instance, the gut, liver, kidney, or a site of action or toxicity. And here are some examples of PBPK models with cabotegravir and ropivirine. So the drug interaction with rifampin 
and UGT1 enzyme inhibition and induction were both modeled using a PBPK. And then dose simulations for children and adolescents have also um, been modeled using PBPK. And this table just shows examples of some of the physiologic and PK data that are used for the model development. Okay, let's move to talking about pharmacodynamics. Um, so we've covered the PK portion. Uh, the PD is the relationship between concentration and desired effect. And when you link the, the PK and the PD data, then the time course of the pharmacological effect can be predicted and optimized. So here's a list of some potential PD measures. You can have clinical response measures, so subjective ones where the patient rates their pain level, for example. Objective measures like survival time, or stroke prevention. Surrogate endpoints, which is like an, a, more, a more immediate endpoint that correlates with clinical outcomes, like having um, a lower blood pressure, or a biomarker, which is a measurable effect produced by a drug, and this biomarker has diagnostic or prognostic value. And then you can have safety biomarkers, so monitoring for potential adverse effects with things like liver function or white cell count or inflammatory um, cytokines. To show you a couple of examples of some PKPD relationships with antiviral drugs. So um, here is a, a plot showing the EC90 for nermotrelvir against various coronaviruses. And what you can see here is that um, the perc uh, percent effect on viral induced CPE was uh, 181. So this um, particular threshold was used to guide dose selection in vivo. And this is an example with um, islatrovir triphosphate showing the declines in viral load from baseline based on the islatrovir triphosphate concentration. And then this is an example showing um, a pretty powerful association with PKPD between intracellular tenofovir diphosphate and the relevant risk reduction in HIV acquisition. Um, there's nearly 100% risk reduction with TDF and imtricitabine um, with dosing commensurate with more than four doses per week. Okay, so that's uh, the whirlwind tour of PKPD. And let's see how some of these concepts apply to two contemporary antivirals. So cabotegravir is an HIV integrase inhibitor. It's used for HIV prevention when given alone and for HIV treatment in combination with ropivirine. It's dosed um, as 400 milligrams injected intramuscularly every four weeks or 600 milligrams every eight weeks. In terms of its metabolism, it's um, broken down by UGT1A1 and UGT1A9. It does not appear to inhibit or induce SIPs or UGTs. In terms of transporters, it's a substrate for PGP, BCRP, and OAT3, but it does not appear to inhibit any transporters. Um, its unbound concentrations are increased in renal impairment, so it's recommended that you monitor patients that have a creatinine clearance of less than 30. And with hepatic impairment, the unbound concentrations are increased, um, but there's no dose adjustment needed for mild or moderate, and the effect of severe is unknown. And this is a highly protein-bound drug. In terms of the cabotegravir PK, um, there's a paper by Hodge that nicely summarizes oral um, intramuscular with Q4 weak dosing and intramuscular Q8 weak dosing um, PK. And you'll see that the um, typical Tmax occurs at, with the intramuscular form at seven days. The Cmax is around um, four. The C-trop is around 2.8 with every four week dosing and 1.6 with every eight week dosing, but there was a lot of variability, about tenfold variability in these week four concentrations in the phase three trials and greater variability is likely to occur in clinical settings outside of research settings. Capitegravir has flip-flop kinetics. So this is when the Ka is slower than the Ke. So thinking back to that question on the pretest, um, the drug is eliminated as rapidly as it is absorbed in this situation. And the half-life in plasma is therefore then based on the Ka rather than the Ke. So this is a picture concept of flip-flop kinetics. Ke is usually the rate limiting step. So that's shown here with the dashed lines. But in the case of flip-flop kinetics, the Ka is the rate limiting step. So I previously showed the output from a pot PK model of cabotegravir, and that model included about 24,000 concentrations from 1,600 individuals, about 72% of which um, were persons with HIV. 
And the model in, uh, evaluated the impact of demographic and clinical factors, injection-related factors, and lab tests on cabotegravir um, PK. And so the first order KA is really the basis for the long-acting CAB formulation and critical to dose frequency and duration of action. And the variability for this parameter was quite high in the model, it was about 58%. So also thinking back to that pretest question. And there were a number of factors that influenced KA, including sex, BMI, and injection needle length and injection splitting. So overall, the data indicate that splitting the injections and using longer needles and having a lower BMI accelerates um, absorption rate. Um, but the absorption rate may be slower in women, and they're going to have higher exposures um, at steady state. Smokers and those with higher weights are going to clear the drug more quickly. So I actually um, don't know this guy, so uh, just found a picture on the web, but this is an example of an individual that could conceivably have um, lower cabotegravir exposures due to these factors. In trials, cabotegravir and cabotegravir ropurine um, had a very high efficacy rate. So in the prevention trials, CAB was superior to um, TDF and FTC with a 69% risk reduction relative to Truvada in men and transgender women, and an 88% risk reduction relative to TDF FTC in women. And in the treatment trials among virologically suppressed adults, um, Q4 week dosing was non-inferior to standard oral antiretroviral therapy and Q8 week dosing was non-inferior to the Q4 week dosing. And across the ALICE, FLARE, and ALICE 2M trials, the confirmed urologic failure rate was very low at about 1.25%. And although the viral failure rates were very low across the phase three trials, um, the CAB ropivirine concentrations were associated with efficacy. This graph shows the ropivirine concentrations on the y-axis and the cabotegravir concentrations on the x-axis. And the median ropivirine concentration um, is shown with the blue line here and the median cabotegravir concentration. I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Um, the ropivirine shown in red and the cabotegravir in blue. And there were 13 failures across these studies, uh, which are shown in the shaded circles and triangles. And 10 of these failures occurred in persons with cab or ropivirine in the 25th percentile of concentrations. And no failures occurred when both of the concentrations of ropivirine and cabotegravir were above the median. In a multivariable model, other factors that were associated with failure included um, the presence of ropivirine uh, resistance associated mutations at baseline, HIV subtype, BMI, and NCD polymorphisms. And this is a simulation of week four troughs. Um, what we find is that about 15% of individuals are going to have concentrations below the 25th percentile for both CAB and ropivirine. And conversely, about 15% are going to have concentrations above um, the, the 75th percentile for both of these drugs. So this suggests that potentially a sizable portion of persons on CAB ropivirine might benefit from PK-driven uh, clinical management. These, these individuals may need higher doses, these individuals um, or more frequent dosing intervals, and these could potentially have a longer um, space between their doses. So CAP concentration targets have been proposed for prevention. I think these could be refined a bit now that we have some PKPD data from the phase three trials. And here are some clinical management questions that are emerging with real world use of long acting agents. And these scenarios illustrate where PK data are needed to guide appropriate management. So some of these questions, um, like I just mentioned about the dosing interval, is it better to give the drug every four weeks or every eight weeks, or could we go even longer for some patients? Can drug exposure be assessed in a patient who developed viremia after switching to long acting cabotegravir ropurine? What's the ideal timing for initiating oral antiretroviral therapy after a cab ropivirine injection in a patient who's not planning or not able to continue long acting? How do weight changes impact the pharmacology of long acting cab ropivirine? And should the dosing intervals be, intervals be modified in persons with HIV who significantly lose, lose or gain weight? What should we do regarding dosing when a patient disengages from care and misses one or more injections? Should oral ART be initiated or should long acting ART be continued? 
And can we monitor drug concentrations in patients who initiate a new medication that could interfere with the metabolism of long-acting cabotegravir or piburine? So these are just some um, questions that I think you could think about, and there are probably a lot more where we may need PK data to guide optimal management. So coming back to the pretest question, um, let's, let's answer this again. So which of the following statements regarding the PK and PKPD of long-acting cabotegravir is correct? And I'll give you just a few moments to answer that. Okay, awesome. 85% of you thought the answer was sex, BMI, and smoking influence cab PK, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. Let's talk about why. Okay, so for the first one, cab absorption rate is faster than the elimination rate. No, this is false. Cab has flip-flop kinetics, and the KA is slower. Variability in cab absorption rate um, is low, that's false. The variability was 58% in the POP-PK model. And for choice four, CAB concentrations are not associated with viral failure or time to viral failure in persons with HIV. This is false. While the overall failure rate was very low, uh, about 1%, 10 of 13 patients that had confirmed viral failure had ropivirine or CAB concentrations below the 25th percentile, and no patient with concentrations of ropivirine or CAB above the median failed. Okay, now let's move to another antiviral, um, nermotrelvir, which has been in the news this past week following results from the EPIC HR study, which we'll discuss um, in just a moment. So um, nermotrelvir is used for SARS-CoV-2. It's a protease inhibitor, and it's given with the pharmacokinetic enhancer, ritonavir, uh, for individuals ages 12 and up, weighing 40 kilograms or more, uh, for use within five days of symptoms in those at high risk. And the dosing is 300, 100 twice daily. That's three tablets for five days. And there's a minimal food effect, um, so it doesn't have to be taken with regard to food. The drug interaction potential is high, and I recommend um, the University of Liverpool website for screening for drug interactions. In terms of um, the interactions, you, know, you cannot use narrow therapeutic, therapeutic index CYP3A4 substrates or potent inducers. And then it's um, a substrate for PGP, OP1B1, and um, some weak inhibition of the following transporters. Uh, renal impairment does increase exposures. It's recommended that you have the dose for moderate impairment, and a study in severe impairment is underway. There's no change um, in the PK with moderate hepatic impairment, no data in severe. And the protein binding for this drug is not high. Um, getting back to the pretest question, it is moderate at 69%. So in terms of establishing the PK target for nermotrelvir, the EC90 was identified with treatment of bronchial epithelial cells for three days, <clears throat> and this became the target CMIN for in vivo studies. Mice infected with um, SARS-CoV-2 MA10 had three log reductions in lung titers when treated with a dose producing CMIN concentrations that were four times the EC90 versus placebo. And while the nermotrelvir bioavailability was good in rats, it was poor in monkeys. And so based on these data, several doses of a suspension formulation were evaluated in first in human studies with and without ritonavir. And here are the results from those studies. On the left, you have the PK with single doses, either alone or um, the three on the top, or the, yeah, these three, given in combination with ritonavir for 10 days. <clears throat> And nermotrelvir appears to be a two-compartment drug based on seeing both the distribution um, and elimination phases in the graph on the left. And on the right, the dose closest to the dose authorized in the emergency use. So this is 250 um, milligrams suspension shown here with 100 milligrams of ritonavir. The troughs were above the protein-adjusted um, EC90 value, which was 292. And this table shows the pharmacokinetics at day five, um, AUC, CMAX, TMAX, et cetera, 
So the C max value was about 4,700 and the C min 1,315. The accumulation in the AUC from day five to day one was about twofold. And then you have clearance volume and half-life estimates shown here as well. I have not seen multi-dose PK data with the 300 milligram tablet formulation yet. Um, so phase two and phase three studies were designed such that 90% of the subjects would achieve troughs above this value of 292. Okay, so those data were used to model the dose for the phase two, phase three trials. And um, this is how they determine that. So um, the projected median C-min um, were three and six times the EC90 with 300 milligrams, 100 milligrams at first dose and steady state respectively. And then this is the model of the viral decline after five days versus 10 days of treatment. And the, the pop model population suggested that five days um, provided a robust viral reduction, but that more than five days didn't appear to offer any meaningful additional benefit. So using this data, um, the EPIC HR trial was um, started and the time from first in human dosing of nermotrelvir to this study was only two months, which is, is quite amazing. So in the high risk study, this was unvaccinated individuals plus at least one risk factor for disease. And the primary endpoint was um, a risk reduction in hospitalization or death. And that was met with an 89% reduction. There were 67% fewer COVID related medical visits also in this population. The EPIC SR study, this is a standard risk study though, was a bit less impressive. So um, vaccinated plus risk factors or unvaccinated with no risk factors did not meet the primary endpoint, which was symptom alle alleviation for four consecutive days. Um, there were some weak associations with the secondary endpoints, uh, a signal for a 57% reduction in hospitalizations and death in vaccinated individuals with at least one risk factor and 62% fewer COVID-related medical visits with a P of 0.02. <clears throat> Um, there are no data at this point with POT-PK from the EPIC trials and no PKPD data from these trials. Um, however, we hope that that information is forthcoming. So getting back to the pretest question, answers three and four would not be correct because we actually don't have these data yet. I was making a guess. Um, but let's think about what kind of information or data would be helpful for these trials. So for the POT-PK studies, you know, what types of intrinsic and extrinsic factors might influence the nermotrelvir PK that we wanna capture. For PKPD relationships, you know, what are our PD endpoints going to be for, for this type of analysis? And then what can we learn from PVPK with this drug? Um, are we interested in exposures in certain tissues or predicting PK in special populations? So getting back to this pretest question two, which of the following statements regarding the PK and PKPD of nermotrelvir ritonvir is correct? That it's highly protein bound, that it's EC90 is 292, that race, weight, and renal function influence the PK, or that a trough above 1,000 was associated with faster time to symptom resolution. Oh, okay, still a little bit of a split on this one. Um, the correct answer was number two of uh, the protein adjusted 90% effective concentration is 292. Um, this drug is not highly protein bound. It's only about 69% protein bound. We don't know what factors influence the PK yet um, because those analyses have not been performed. And we also don't know what concentration might be associated with a faster time to symptom resolution because this also has not yet been assessed. So the correct answer for this is number two. Okay, um, finally, we're gonna talk about some PKPD study design considerations and analytical tools. 
So um, non-adherence is common. It's the number one reason that meds don't work the way they're supposed to. And studies show that the average rate of adherence to all medications is about 50%. And we know that traditional measures like self-report, pill count, overestimate adherence. So when possible, it's good to use objective measures of adherence. They can be technology-based or PK-based. So these are some technology-based measures that could be used, um, MEMS caps or smart pillboxes, which deliver real-time information about at least um, the opening of the device. You can use apps on a smartphone, uh, FaceTime to, to watch someone take the medication, or timestamp, which actually is free and gives the time and date stamp for the dose. Um, artificial intelligence platforms, these um, cost money, but are also possible with the use of smartphones. And then there are um, devices such as ingestible sensors, which would encapsulate a medication and when um, ingested would uh, signal to a device that a medication was ingested. There are also PK-based measures of adherence. This is one with tenofovir diphosphate. So in red cells, tenofovir diphosphate has a really long half-life, so it's analogous to like a hemoglobin A1C for tenofovir dosing. And when we conducted DOT studies, we determined that the tenofovir diphosphate concentrations um, could be associated with different dosing frequencies. So this was um, a really objective way to look at uh, adherence to this particular medication. Question I'm often asked at the, at the time that we're designing a study is whether I need to do intensive PK sampling in this study or whether sparse um, or population sampling would be sufficient. And I think some of the situations where it's useful are early in drug development, when we want to define the PK, um, dose finding in a new population, or for drug interaction assessments. But some questions to ask, are there intensive PK data already available for the same drug or, um, or for the same population or a similar population? And if intensive PK data are needed or desired, you may not necessarily need to get it in all subjects. And then will single dose data be reflective of steady state data? And that depends on whether the drug has linear or dose proportional PK. If you do intensive sampling and the medication should be given with a meal, it's good to standardize the meal. There's a lot of variability that can be introduced from food, even for drugs that say, you know, can be taken without regard to food. So try to control this if possible. Observe the dosing. You'd be surprised how often this doesn't happen in the clinic. Um, the PK sampling strategy should also be compatible with the half-life of the drug. We want to make sure that we're sampling long enough. We don't want to estimate, ideally, more than 30% of the total AUC. That's the portion in red. And population PK does not always mean convenient sampling. I guess it depends on the half-life of the drug. Um, you're going to gain the most information, though, when there are multiple measures of, uh, within an individual, and the sampling times post-dose vary both within and between subjects. And there are some statistical approaches such as optimal design theory that could be used to determine the optimal times to sample and the number of samples needed at those time points. At a minimum, if you're doing um, pot PK, you should need to collect information on the dose amounts, the dose times, the draw times, the sex, race, weight, and age. And then what data do we already have that, about factors that influence the PK or PD of the drug? We wanna collect information on those factors. Um, consider organ function, concomitant medications, and pharmacogenomics. And sometimes we um, don't know at the start of the study what we need to be looking for. So it's a really good idea to bank samples for future analyses so that you can perform some PKPD associations if need be to provide some clinical context to your study findings. Um, plasma and DBS are relative, and HDNA even are relatively easy um, to collect. While we often use plasma to assess PKPD relationships because it's an easily accessible biomatrix, there are circumstances where plasma may not be informative for establishing the PKPD, such as with the nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. Um, the prodrug and hydrolysis metabolites for the nukes may be able to be measured in blood, but the phosphorylated active form is actually ionized and trapped in cells and is therefore measured in cells. So for collecting um, cells, blood cells you know, are pretty easy to obtain, but others may be um, too invasive or too impractical. For PBMCs, it's important to have an accurate cell count for interpreting the results. And for DBS, there are some important analytical factors to consider when developing these methods, such as you know, punch size, punch location, the hematocrit effect, um, et cetera. And then tissues and fluids, you know, collection Analysis and interpretation of these is really complicated, so please enlist the expertise 
um, of, of an individual that has experience in study design and collection for this type of sample. So I think COVID shutdowns really highlighted the need to find alternatives to in-person clinic and research visits to obtain samples. So um, there are a number of possibilities for collecting samples um, at home. Uh, we're currently conducting a study to compare tenofovir diphosphate and DBS via in-person blood collection and at home um, self-collection. We call this the home two study. And here are a couple of examples of options for this collection at home. This is a Mitra device and this is a Tasso device and both of them collect you know, a certain amount of blood and are fairly easy to use. Uh, we also previously discussed scenarios with cabotegravir or pivorine where drug concentrations could guide clinical management. And this would be greatly facilitated if we moved the testing to the bedside and were able to provide a real time result. So our group is developing a point of care test for cabotegravir or pivorine using a mini mass spec, which is about the size of a shoebox, and as well as the alcohol biomarker phosphatidyl ethanol which we plan to also measure, um, see if we can move that to the clinic as well. So in conclusion, um, defining the PK and factors that impact PK and establishing PKPD relationships is essential for informed and optimal use of antiviral drugs. And this is critical with new agents and new methods of drug delivery as I hope I've shown today. And there are many analytical tools and study design considerations that will maximize the information gained through PK and PKPD analyses. And there are several helpful resources to assist in this effort. So unfortunately, not all the PK and PKPD data for a drug are in the public domain or, or, or aren't, aren't published um, on PubMed or presented at meetings, but you can find a lot of the information at the FDA website in the packet that the pharmaceutical companies submit for regulatory approval of the drug. So you, at Drugs FDA, you can search by brand name and then ClinPharm and Biopharmaceutics Review and um, get some information on additional information that may not be published or presented. The FDA guidances for industry are also helpful for designing studies that utilize POPPK or PBPK to assess PKPD relationships. And lastly, if you're interested in learning more about PK or PK modeling software, Sertara, this is the maker of Phoenix software, has courses offered through Sertara University. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge members of our Colorado Antiviral Pharmacology Laboratory, especially Drs. Peter Anderson, Christina Brooks, and Jose Castillo Mencia, who provided ideas and helpful discussions and slides and data for this talk. And at the University of Colorado, we are a Sertara Center of Excellence, so we have complimentary access to Phoenix software and helpful training materials, some of which were included in my talk today. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna show these poll questions again. Hopefully now this is the third time. Um, we got everybody at 100%. Okay, so the first one's about cabotegravir. All right, got up to 94%, that's awesome. All right, and then let's close that one out and move on to the, <laughs> to the next one. Okay, next question, Jose. Nerma, this one's about nermotrelvir. There we go, okay. Okay, up to 91% for this one. Yes, the correct answer is number two. And I bet we'll have some data on numbers three and four um, in the very near future. Okay, thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to take questions. Terrific, thank you, Jennifer. That was a spectacular presentation. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the Q&A. 
And so maybe we can launch into those. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, a question on what you do about the variability in cabotegravir and rilpivirine pharmacokinetics and the um, potential uh, influence on the development of resistance to one or both of those drugs. So there's a, a, a question from John Zuli that says, given the high variability in the pharmacokinetics of intramuscular cab and association with resistance, what would you recommend regarding therapeutic drug monitoring? How would you ad adjust dosing if the concentrations were low? And is anyone performing serum cabotegravir uh, concentration measurement commercially? And before you answer that, there's a related question from Susanna Coratori that says, would a body weight based dosing of cabotegravir be more suitable compared to fixed dose regimen? Those are, I think, two questions related to dose individualization and or therapeutic drug monitoring for cabotegravir and rilpivirine. Yeah, I think it highlights that not only the questions that, that we listed that were coming up, but also these questions, I think it highlights how much we still need to learn about, you know, how best to give these. Um, I think in an ideal world, we would be able to measure the cabotegravir and ropivirine uh, real time. And if they were, you know, below the um, first, uh, below the 25th um, percentile for their exposures, then we could consider dosing sooner. Um, I think that would be an ideal circumstance, but I think that's a few years away until we actually research it. Um, in terms of, you know, weight-based dosing, would that be better than fixed dose? You know, it, it's... Um, <clears throat> I think it would might be difficult to achieve in practice, but um, you know I think it's something worth studying. Yeah. So just to add to that, um, there have if you look at the studies on um, the association between body mass index and uh, cabotegravir concentrations, the effect is most pronounced early after beginning dosing. So in the first eight weeks, um, after eight weeks of dosing, twelve weeks and beyond the a relationship between high BMI patients and um, average or low BMI patients, concentrations look quite comparable. So I think uh, as Jennifer pointed out, high BMI people absorb the drug more slowly, but the absorption is still complete. So that their uh, true steady state with a long acting drug like this takes a couple of months, two or three months to achieve. And once you get to true steady state, even if you're absorbing the drug more slowly, your steady state concentrations are, are the same. So I think weight-based dosing is probably the easiest of those things to address. Um, the, the, uh, I, I think the more troubling question is the entire question of therapeutic drug monitoring, um, because uh, as, as you pointed out, Jennifer, low concentrations are associated with treatment failure and resistance. Um, and developing resistance to cabotegravir is bad news because integrase inhibitor resistance is bad news because it can cross over to resistance to other integrase inhibitors. And we'd like to prevent that, it, prevent that if at all possible. But it sounds like nobody's really pursuing therapeutic drug monitoring yet. Well, um, Jose Castillo-Mencia and Pete Anderson are, you know, have a grant to look at this. So I think maybe we'll have some, um, a, a, at least set up a framework whereby we could potentially figure out how best to, to implement this in practice. Great. Yep. Um, all right. So um, that's the cabotegravir therapeutic drug monitoring. There's a, a question about um, food effects. So there's a question from Terrence Donovan. Can you address taking integrase inhibitors or, or on an empty stomach or with food as far as reducing side effects? That's a side effect question. Um, any other classes or specific meds where eating or not eating is important? Um, we talked a little bit about food influences uh, during your talk, but um, as a practical matter, how important is, is uh, uh, taking a, a drug with a meal or without a meal on pharmacokinetics? It, it's drug specific, I'd say, but, um, you know, certainly for 
Um, some drugs, like for tenofovir disoproxifumarate, taking it with a meal is very helpful. So um, there are esterases that are, you know, involved in converting that enzyme. And so if you take it with food, then the esterases are kind of acting more on the food. And so you can potentially get more of that drug absorbed. So there are situations like that for specific agents where taking it with food really does um, help uh, improve the PK. And I guess in situations where someone is having a toxicity um, that's thought to be, you know, related to exposures that, you know, if it is a drug that is affected by food, then, um, you know, not taking that drug, I guess, uh, without food might be an option. And do you want to address um, effect of food on oral rilpivirine since um, most people are still using an oral lead-in phase for rilpivirine and cabotegravir? Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Charlie. Um, uh, so... So real pivoting, oral real pivoting should be given with food, right? right. Or, um, or, and, and also not taken with a proton pump inhibitor. Yeah, which, um, so, so in those situations, um, I guess, yeah, does CAB have to, I can't remember, does CAB have to be taken the oral form with food or is it without regard to food? It's without regard, but only real pivoting. But that, okay. it's an important point that a lot of people lose track of uh -huh. because when you're transitioning somebody from a regimen like Bictegravir, a, a Bictegravir based regimen where they don't have to take the drug with food to a month's lead in with oral cab and rilpivirine. It's just important to remember that they do need to take that drug, those drugs. Um, people are usually taking the cab and rilpivirine at the same time to take them with food um, rather than uh, on an empty stomach because of the absorption of, of uh, rilpivirine. So that's an important point. Thanks for answering that one, Charlie. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, um, let's see. Oh, uh, questions related to genetic polymorphisms. Um, there's a question about, a couple of questions related to polymorphisms. There's one question from Rustin Crutchley. What polymorphisms in particular were associated with lower Cabotegravir, cabotegravir real pivoting concentrations. I'm assuming that's genetic polymorphisms. Right. Yeah, I, I have to, I know I, I've got to look at the study to recall, but I know that the L74 mutation, I think that's the, the correct mutation, um, was not associated with confirmed virologic failure, but was associated with time to confirm virologic failure. So that is one particular insta mutation that was um, kind of called out in the um, and the paper looking at um, predictors of failure. Okay, great. And a uh, related question, um, is uh, any data on the impact of genetic variations in um, glucuronosyl transferase, UGT1A1, and cabotegravir pharmacokinetics? Yeah, I'd refer you to the um, uh, PBPK paper that looked at the effect of um, inhibition and induction of glucuronidation on the cabotegravir pharmacokinetics. Um, so th that is the one paper that I know that has looked at that. Okay, great, good. Um, so um, another question, interesting question uh, from Terrence Donovan. Um, I have a, I have a long-term patient who recently went on an ayahuasca retreat. I don't even know. I don't know what that is, and I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but it's some kind of hallucinogen, an ayahuasca retreat in Brazil. He had lots of vomiting during the experience and came back with normal labs two weeks after ingesting the ayahuasca. Any warnings we should be giving patients who are partaking in non-medical psychedelic use? Um, and I think this opens up the whole yeah. question about um, drugs of abuse, uh, illicit drugs, and antiretrovirals. What do we know about potential interactions there, and what should we be telling our patients? Yeah, I think, I mean, the general message I give my patients is anything you put in your body is a drug. So whether that's um, a recreational drug, uh, even a multivitamin, an herbal, a dietary supplement. So I, I suggest that they run all the medications, even the supplements that they plan to take, you know, through their um, clinical pharmacist, if they have one, or through their provider, so that they can screen for potential drug interactions. Um, 
I'm not familiar with ayahuasca. I, I have definitely heard of it, but I am not familiar with its pharmacologic profile. So I need to look into that agent specifically, but I think it's a good idea that um, our patients consult us for many of the, uh, for basically any medication or supplement that they plan to take so that they know that there's a risk for interactions um, with their antiretroviral medications. Yeah, and you know, um, there have been several published reviews on this topic. Marta Bofito and her colleagues at the University of Liverpool and in London have written about um, uh, rave drugs, drugs used by people who you know, go off and, and uh, take uh, mind altering drugs and, and uh, engage in, in, uh, um, in sexual conduct over crazy weekends. So um, this is something that our patients do. And um, we do need to be careful about the potential impact of those drugs on antiretrovirals and vice versa. I think the main concern I've seen is using cobis is in people who are using cobisostat or ritonavir based regimens. Right. Because, um, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I agree with you there. I think that, you know, some of the recreational drugs we use are CYP3A substrates. And so you can have an increase in their exposures when used with a pharmacokinetic enhancer like ritonavir or cobisostat. And I also agree with you, Charlie, chemsex agents can, do have a potential for drug interactions. Um, and, and it's also an important class to discuss with your provider. And, and chemsex often involves using sildenafil or other um, uh, erectile dysfunction drugs. You want to say a little, you want to say a few words about potential interactions with those drugs? Sure. So um, those particular agents, many of them are substrates for CYP3A and their concentrations can be significantly elevated if you're taking an antiretroviral regimen that includes um, a booster or another inhibiting agent. You can have a significant increase in exposures. So the doses of those are typically very low when we use them in practice. Um, so that may be something that, you know, patients should be aware of as a potential risk. Yep, great. So there are a couple of questions about um, uh, nirmatrelvir uh, and um, uh, ritonavir, the, the, the uh, common drug combination. So there is a question from Judy that says, uh, when we use Paxlovid with patients on cobisostat or uh, norvir, ritonavir, um, we don't dose adjust or hold the Norvir in the Paxlovid dose pack, since it is only a five-day course, um, can we ignore that interaction? And she adds in parentheses, this was the recommendation at a recent um, lecture she heard, an MAETC lecture series. So what do you do with a, a HIV-infected patient taking a, a cobisostat or ritonavir-containing regimen uh, if you have to put them on um, or matrilvir, uh, ritonavir combination for five days? Yeah, it's a short period of time. So the thought is that there would not be an increased risk over this short duration. But, uh, you know, I would encourage um, patients to monitor for potential side effects and discuss those with the provider in case a dose alteration is needed. But it adds more complication um, for what might be a small risk for a short period of time. And, and let me ask you something. Um, uh, you, when you reviewed the pharmacokinetics, of nirmatrelvir and ritonavir, um, you pointed out there was a pretty significant effect of advanced renal disease on the pharmacokinetics of nirmatrelvir. Um, can you explain that since I thought the drug was mainly a CYP3A4 substrate? Yeah, so once you introduce the ritonavir, the main path of clearance for the nirmatrelvir appears to be renal. And so I think that um, alterations in renal function did cause an increase, but it's important also to note that even when a drug is primarily hepatically metabolized, that there may be an increase in exposures with renal impairment because of the uremic toxins that accumulate in patients with renal impairment. Those uremic toxins may compete for metabolism with the cytochrome P450 enzymes, and so you often will see an elevated exposure even in drugs that are primarily hepatically metabolized um, with renal impairment. This We saw this a lot with hep C therapies. Great. Okay. Uh, so um, I think we have gone through all of, oh no, sorry, not yet. Um, there's one more question, question from uh, Catherine Wersowski. Uh, 
She says, is there any potential information on what populations may benefit from every four week cabotegravir pivarine intramuscular instead of every eight week? And, and I would just add, this question comes up a lot. And how do you make that decision? Because if you ask patients, would you rather take this drug every eight weeks or every four weeks? The answer is obvious. Uh, you know, everybody wants it every eight weeks, but are there patients in whom that's not a great idea and, and how can we make that decision? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think it's, it's not always easy to know which of your patients are going to be, um, you know, coming in on time for their visits. But I guess if you have any reason to believe that your patient may not be able to come consistently every eight weeks, that may be a reason to try to do every four weeks, because then if they're late for one of the injections, um, they're not that late. You know, we're not getting at week 10 here, we're getting at week six. Um, another population I think I, I showed in the, the figure may be individuals who, you know, are really muscular, really large and smokers. Um, they may be a group that tends to have uh, lower cabotegravir exposures and might benefit for more frequent dosing. We definitely think we need uh, more studies to figure out exactly which populations might be best for the Q4 versus Q8. Great. Uh, and then, uh, Jen, there's a question from Jose Castillo Mancia, your colleague. Uh -huh. uh, he says, do you think that disease state influences the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationship? For example, in the setting of long acting ART, do you think the effect of cabotegravir realpivirine could be different in people living with HIV who come into the regimen with long term suppression versus those who initiate earlier after achieving suppression? And he has the same question for. Uh, near natural or ritonavir, do you think the PK-PD relationship is different for someone with recent infection versus someone who's had symptoms for three or four days? So a question about whether the state of disease might influence the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationship. I think it's possible. I mean, if you have um, higher viral load and uh, have you know, kind of more advanced disease, then it may be that it, you, that higher concentrations are required to achieve the same effect. I know we've certainly seen that with hepatitis C therapies, where if you've got um, a genotype three, which is harder to treat, and you have um, uh, a fiber scan showing that you have quite a bit of cirrhosis, then you definitely need more aggressive therapy. So I think that is um, definitely the case or could be the case for cabotegravir and as well as nermotrelvir. And that may be one of the factors that we're able to tease out a bit more from um, some of the uh, PKPD analyses that I hope will come out of EPIC-HR and EPIC-SR is that we'll be able to figure out which patients um, you know, benefited the most and what factors were likely to be associated with whether they would benefit. So uh, just a couple of, a couple of add-ons to that. So um, obviously with, with drugs like uh, nirmatrelvir or ritonavir that are given for an acute viral infection, and the same thing applies to drugs for influenza, for example, um, uh, Tamiflu and related agents for influenza, the earlier you start those drugs after symptoms in general, the, the more effective they are. So that's really a pharmacodynamic effect rather than a pharmacokinetic effect. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I do think you need to keep that in mind when treating, um, when treating acute infections, uh, particularly acute respiratory infections like influenza or coronavirus. Um, the other interesting topic or interesting uh, category of drugs related to that is monoclonal antibodies. So with broadly neutralizing anti-HIV monoclonal antibodies, people have looked at the pharmacokinetics of those drugs in aviremic individuals on suppressive therapy versus viremic individuals who in most cases have stopped therapy so that they can assess the potential impact of the drug on their um, on their uh, on their virus and and the pharmacokinetics of those drugs interestingly are different whether you're averemic or viremic and presumably that's because the, uh, uh, the the relative doses of those drugs are lower in terms of their molar doses and they're binding to HIV in um, uh, uh, either they're either uh, in, in, in all in all likelihood their clearance is being facilitated facilitated by the binding of, uh, to HIV envelope protein on the surface of cells in the body. 
And so if you've got a lot of active, active ongoing replication, um, you uh, mop up those drugs and you clear them more quickly, which is interesting. But for most antiretrovirals, that's not the case. You know, the, the mass dose of the drug greatly overwhelms the amount of virus in the body. So uh, you don't really see, you don't see a similar effect with any other class of antiretroviral that I'm aware of. Yeah, we, we also, I guess, see this with hep B and hep C drugs, I think maybe for a different reason, but um, patients that, I mean, at least the difference between hep C patients and, and healthy volunteers, those with uh, hep C and, and detectable virus tend to have higher levels than those um, that either have a DSVR or even have suppressed um, virus, something about, you know, the, I guess, injury to the liver or impairment of the virus directly to the enzymes. Um, which may have a different, this therefore resulting in a different PK profile. Yep, great. Well, uh, we, uh, sadly, we've reached the end of our hour and 15 minutes, and uh, we are going to have to bring this session to a close, but I want to really thank Dr. Kaiser for sharing her expertise and insights with us today, and thank all of you for participating in this webinar. Um, as I said uh, before, and as was just posted in the chat, the uh, recording of this presentation and the slides will be available on the IAS USA website within 24 hours. Um, and Jose has posted the address in the chat uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, the web address. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody, particularly Jennifer, and thanks to the folks at IAS USA for running a, a, a terrific and informative webinar. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So Jose, I don't know if you have any uh, last minute closing uh, business uh, uh, messages for the attendees. Yes, thank you, Dr. Flexner. And thank you, Dr. Kaiser as well for an excellent discussion. As a reminder to our audience, evaluation and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by 5 p.m. Pacific time tomorrow. And this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. A couple promotional slides for our upcoming activities. Here are a list of upcoming webinars. Next week, we have a webinar on the implementation of long-acting PrEP. To register, please visit the IAS USA website. Additionally, here's a list of courses that we have and an upcoming COVID-19 dialogue at the start of July. And the Ryan White Clinical Conference is now open for registration. Lastly, save the date for CROI 2023, which will be held at Seattle, Washington from February 19th through the 22nd. Again, I'd like to thank the audience for your participation. And this concludes today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.